Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Gerard van Emnes, CEO of Advance Health Limited. Um, welcome to the presentation of our interim results, the last six months ending December 2019, unaudited consolidated financials. The presentation will be shared by myself and two of my colleagues. The one colleague would be our new CFO, Snei Tinchoko. I hope she will pronounce her surname better than I do. I do apologize. And then also from Australia, my colleague Mark Gresnik from PressMet Australia. I'm first going to ask Snei to present the financial performance up till December and then I will have a few um, comments around the strategy and where we are and where we're heading with this and then we'll ask Mark to present PressMet Australia. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gerhard. Uh, my name is Sne, as he said. Uh, Sne, like I am full, and my surname is Tono. Um, yeah, I hope next year we'll get it right. But yeah, so it's Tono. Uh, so I'm very honored this afternoon to present to you this beautiful result um, that we've achieved in the first six months of um, 2020 financial year, starting from the 1st of July. Uh, to the 31st of December 2019. Uh, I will just want to talk through the format of the presentation first because I think you would be aware or, or some of you might not be aware but there is a new standard that was uh, adopted in our environment from the beginning of the financial year which is called FRS 16 which has a very major impact in both the income statement and the balance sheet. And just to make sure that we have numbers that are comparable to prior years so that we can understand exactly what has happened, whether the business is growing or it's going backwards, we have presented both of the views, the view that includes FRS 16 and the view that does not include FRS 16, so obviously the view that is not distorted. So the very first slide in page 3, if you follow the presentation, um, it's the highlights and that exclude FRS 16 impact. So it's basically comparing the numbers on like um, on like basis. And you would, as you would see, ladies and gentlemen, I mean, like everything is green, and it means that we've done absolutely very very well when compared uh, to the first six months of 2019 financial year. And I think that is something that needs to be uh, commended and we, we obviously recognize the hard work that has been done by our team and by all the executives uh, to achieve the results that we see today. Uh, starting with the number of cases, which is basically the activities, you will see that in the Australian operation we've increased by 2%, South African environment increased by 24%, overall the group increased by 14%. And that obviously directly translates into revenue. You will see in Australia, revenue increased by 2%, which is in line with the increase in activities. Uh, in South Africa, we increased our revenue by 22%, and overall for the group, 9%. EBITDA, which is ending before interest tax, depreciation, and amortization, um, in Australia, increased by 28%, in South Africa, by 40%. And overall, for a group, it increased by more than 100%. Again, very, very good performance there. You know, we can see that the revenue that we are getting is actually flowing down to the bottom line. Uh, profits loss uh, before tax, uh, after tax, sorry. Uh, in the Australian environment, it increased by 60%. So that is profit uh, in Australia, better than the uh, um, last year by 60% in the South African environment. It is the losses that have reduced by 10% when compared to the first six months of 2019 financial year. Overall for the group, losses decreased by 40%. That was the view that is excluding the FRS 16 impact. So if you page to the next slide, uh, which is in page four, uh, including the impact of FRS 16, the number of cases remain the same, revenue remains the same. The only change that we start to see is on the EBITDA level. And uh, as you can see there, EBITDA suddenly goes up. And the main reason is because obviously the rental 
um, now is dropped it down and it gets to be replaced by the interest and the depreciation expense. So in Australia, if you obviously strip away the rental as prescribed by the standard, the um, EBITDA goes up by 72% versus the 28% that we see that we saw there, uh, which was before um, um, April 16 in the South African environment, it jumps to uh, more than 100%. And for the total group, it's more than 100%. Uh, and if you look at the loss of profit for the period after tax, uh, Australia increased by 23%, and in South Africa, uh, the loss is actually increased by 35%, and for the total group, it increased by 49%. I think I would like to take maybe the questions after I finish go through the numbers. Yeah, then not much sense with our numbers. Uh, Australia is it in rands or in dollars? It is in rands. It's converted into rands. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So the question there was that are the Australian numbers in uh, Australian dollars or it's in rand, and the answer is that all the numbers are converted into rands. Okay. We move into the next slide, which is in page five. That is basically just for noting, ladies and gentlemen, which just shows there the exchange rate fluctuation. So obviously, in, you can see there that when compared to the second quarter of 2019, um, 2019 financial year or the first six months of the 2019 financial year, the rent has actually strengthened against the, the Australian dollar, which is obviously not what is desired in our environment as it, it decreases the numbers there. When we look at the number of cases, moving to the next slide, you can actually see there, ladies and gentlemen, that obviously we are a great company. Um, as a graph depicts, uh, we have our activities have increased when compared to the first six months of 2019 financial year. Uh, a little bit of a a, a downslope there when you look at um, the movement between the first quarter of 2020 to the second quarter and that is mainly as a result of holiday seasonality and I think that is in line with what has happened in the previous financial year as if you can see the chart if you look at the second quarter of 2019 financial year you sort of like have that drop there which is mainly because of seasonality so moving on to the next slide which is the consolidated statement of financial position as of the 31st of December 2019. Again, in the statement of financial position or rather the balance sheet, you can see that we've presented both the views, um, the blue column being the numbers that uh, exclude FR16 so that you are able to compare uh, to what was presented on the 30th of June 2019. Uh, and the numbers that are just December 2019 are the numbers that include the impact of FR16. I think when you look at the numbers that exclude FR16, you would note that everything is more or less stable. It is in line with what was reported um, on the 30th of June 2019, so there hasn't been much movement in the balance sheet from the asset perspective. Uh, the only thing that is of note today is um, that we've collected most of our data. So if you look at the current exit section, which is the trade and other receivables, you will see that we've moved from 37.7 million to 24.9 million, which I think is something to note that we've actually collected more of the money that was tied in the data and it actually has flown into our bank account. If you look at the numbers that are included, uh, that includes FR16, you would see that there is a non-current asset and there is a new asset there that is introduced which is the right of asset use of uh, um, uh, 497.5 million which was previously not there and that is as a direct result of FR16. So if we move to the next slide and look at the equities and the liabilities. Again, in the equity section, you would note that there is not much of a change from um, what was reported uh, on the 30th of June 2019. The only thing that has changed there is obviously a little bit of incremental of losses um, that has happened um, between June and uh, December 
2019. Otherwise, everything stands still. And the non-current uh, liabilities, um, nothing has changed. If you look at the view, which is the blue part, that exclude FS16, um, everything has more or less remained the same. But if you look at the view that includes FR16, you will see again that there is new liability there that is called a list liability, which is obviously as a result of a change in standard of 506 million or 500, 506 million that is introduced there. Uh, moving on to the next slide, the income statement. I think I will dwell a bit on this. One, because I think this is the story that we want to tell to our shareholders out there that we've actually done a very good job in the first six months of the 2020 financial year. So if you look at revenue, as um, was seen in the first slide, you can actually see an increase of 9%. Moving from a 244 million to 265 million. Uh, look at it, looking at cost of sales, an increase of 6% compared to what it was in the first six months of 2019 financial year. Again, I think that is a very good thing and a beautiful story to tell right there that we are managing our direct cost mm. much better. Um, we are bringing more revenue and the cost to the revenue is actually only growing by 6% as opposed to 9%, which is the growth of our revenue. If you look at the gross profit margins, again, an improvement from 53% of what we reported in the 2019 financial year to 54% in the current year. 2% growth there, which is a very good thing again that we've done there. If you look at the other operating expenses, uh, a growth of 3%, which is below inflation, and also, I mean, like one would expect that with an increase in revenue, you would have increased your cost base to support the growing revenue. And in our environment, we didn't do that. We've managed to keep our cost at a very, very low base so that we can drop as much of the revenue to the bottom line as much as possible. So I think that is very good to note that we've increased our revenue by 9%. Meanwhile, our cost base has just grown by 3%, which is less than inflation when compared to the prior year. If you look at EBITDA, uh, you would note that it has increased by more than 100% from uh, 4.5 million that we reported in the first six months of 2019 financial year uh, to 14.8 million in the current year. I'm looking at the figures that are excluding FR16. Um, and if you look at the loss uh, before taxation from uh, continuing operations, you can actually see there that we have improved those losses from 21.3 million that we reported in the first six months of 2019 financial year to 13.1 uh, uh, million in the current financial year, or rather the first six months of the 2020 financial year. Again, I think that is very, very nice. We're moving in the right direction as much as we haven't reached our break-even point. But I think we are moving in the right direction and we are confident and comfortable that we will get this company in a break-even point and into the profitability status going forward. Um, if you look at the profit after taxation, obviously being reduced there by the deferred tax component, um, we, have, we are reporting an improved losses from a 15.4 million that we reported in the first six months of 2019 financial year <coughs> to 9.3 million in the current year. Again, I think it is a very huge improvement because we are basically 40% better <coughs> than what we were last year. Uh, looking at the loss or um, loss per share, an improvement of 40% again from what it was in the first six months of the 2019 financial year, which was a loss of 6 rand point 21 cent um, to 3 rand point 75 cent in the first six months of 2020 financial year. Okay, moving to the statement of cash flow position.
Uh, the only thing to note today, I think all the figures more or less are stable and they are as were um, reported in, in June 2019 or rather in uh, the first six months of 2019 financial year. The only thing that is to note today is that cash generated from um, operations which seems to have jumped to 43.8 million versus a 16 Point seven million that you had in the uh, first six months of 2019 financial year and the main reason for that is the reclassification of the rental expense from operating activities to um, financing activities so you would see that as much as there is an improvement in cash flow from operating activities we have actually done worse in the net inflows from financing activities and it's mainly because of that reallocation and I think the amount is 23.3 million as noted on the side note of their presentation. Moving over to the statement of changes in equity. Again, the only thing that is to note today is the, the, the change in accounting standard which uh, has which is FR16 again which has caused some of the amounts that were previously in the balance sheet uh, to be recycled to the written earnings and that amount is 17.2 million uh, positive that you see there. Moving on to the next slide which just shows us the segmental view of the income statement You would note that for both uh, South African environment and the Australian environment, when you look at the revenue, we have improved for both the segments. Uh, in South Africa, moving from 95.9 million, um, from 78.3 million to 95.9 million. In the Australian environment, moving from 165.6 million to 169.5 million. And obviously, which has given us the gross increase they of um, the 265.4 million versus the uh, 2.244.1 um, two, uh, million in the first six months of 2019 financial year. Um, the other thing that is to note today, the interest expense, you would note that um, if you look at the numbers, um, that includes the FR16 impact uh, that the interest expense for South Africa has grown drastically and that is merely because most of our leases in the South African environment are still very new, meaning that the liability that is caused by FR16 is very, very high and obviously making the interest component there to be high. Um, loss or profit before tax, South Africa reported a loss and the main reason I, I would assume that we already know that the South African environment, the operation in the South African environment are fairly new as opposed to the Australian environment which is quite a, a very mature and a stable market that has existed over the years and they are obviously in a profitable uh, status when compared to the South African environment which is still in a loss making status. But again, uh, you would see that even though South Africa is still making losses, but those losses have improved uh, as opposed to what we reported in the first six months of 2019 financial year, which was uh, 23.5 million to 21.1 that we are reporting in the current financial year. Australia's uh, profit have increased from uh, 8.3 million to 13.3 uh, million in the current financial year or rather in the first six months of the current financial year. Uh, looking at the ratios, again with the ratios we've presented both the views because FR16 has caused a little bit of destruction in terms of the view they if you compare to the first six months of 2019 financial year, uh, the blue part being the part that is adjusted of FR16 meaning that it's like on like when we compare to 20, uh, the first six months of 2019 financial year. Again, most of these ratios are improving. Quick ratio or the asset test ratio 
uh, even though it's below the norm of one is to one, but it's still moving in the right direction and we're quite happy with what we have there a 0 0.89 as opposed to a 0 0.88 that we announced in the first six months of 2019 financial year. And the current ratio also shows a little bit of an improvement there from a 1.02 to a 1.06 um, in the current financial year. And the next debt, uh, less cash to equity, that has worsened a little bit. Uh, from an 84% to a 101% and that is mainly because we are still funding our losses via debt. Um, as we get to a profitable status, the plan is to pay off the debt as soon as possible. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I would hand over to Kera to continue. Thank you, Snake. Um, well done. Ladies and gentlemen, I think it leaves us at a position where you would at least see we're moving in the right direction. We are also frustrated and disappointed that we are not further ahead with our progress. However, that being said, if I look at all the share prices of hospital groups listed, um, it's all a bit disappointing and I think the two things that has not been factored properly or taken into account over the last five years. It's the sluggish economy and um, the cost of competition. However, where does it leave us to go move forward? If you allow me to make a few comments, um, our focus is obviously to find the optimal level of advanced health and that talks to case mix so that we can look after the gross profit of all the procedures in theater. It talks to procurement strategy and also to our marketing efforts that we make. Then we would like to become an active contributor to the low cost healthcare in South Africa. We do foresee ourselves playing a significant part in a national health insurance but also currently where medical schemes are under pressure with their increases that's been always higher than inflation, they need to move on their cost as well which they cover through the medical aids. Then obviously we want to participate in the mobility of highly skilled healthcare specialists. What do I mean by that in layman's term? I'm basically saying we want to create alternatives for specialists that they're not necessarily limited or restricted to one or two acute hospitals in which they have to operate. But they can also have a different scenario and that will move the skill around and it will give some mobility in the sense that more people will have access closer to a certain radius of their own suburb. In a highly dominated market, we would like to be coming more of somebody that stimulate the market so that medical schemes don't necessarily have to take the tariff increases as presented by the three big groups today, but also allow small players like ourselves to come in with some price cutting exercise. And then for the member, it would have more choice, which should be financially beneficial for the healthcare into the future. Just maybe the story up till now, obviously it was a very aggressive growth. As you can see, we started in 2014 and five years later we opened our 11th day hospital. Um, this puts a huge pressure on your cash flow and obviously on your capital that you have to do the necessary growth. But we've done well up till now. I think the big ticket items I would like to highlight to you today is that we sold 25.1% to um, an investment group in Australia that take some um, shares up in the, the Australian press met and that we sold for a price of 58.3 million. It's still subject to shareholders vote but we're very far down the line. 
I think what is important is to say that there are some interest in a very mature market and advanced health limited still have the controlling share in PressMed Australia. Then our doors open in January at Harbour Bay, the new hospital in Simonstown, where we look forward to be sure we're going to have quite a busy year. What was strategic for us there was the fact that there is no immediate hospital in that vicinity. So the, there are two competitors and they are 15 kilometers or further away. And it's that side of the, uh, the mountain which makes it a bit more attractive for people who doesn't want to travel necessarily into Cape Town for treatment. The group revenue has increased with 9%, 2% in, South Af uh, in Australia and 22% in South Africa, obviously a lower base from which we departure. And then we would like to move forward with our relationships with the funders and we're also looking at the moment of creating one or two centres of excellence. One for pain management in the back for people and the other one would look upon cataracts and we would pilot them on a small scale but it may be something for the future that you rather create centers of excellence where people can go and get the best possible treatment in that sense. Factors that we need to address increase the participation of the funders, focus on cost efficiency in an economy with high unemployment and a lack of growth. Obviously that impact on our income streams as well, or directly or indirectly, and we must become more cost efficient. Then attend to the influence of the three big hospital groups so that we can play our part in the value chain. It gives options, it allows medical schemes to negotiate better prices overall, but most importantly, it positions us in a very nice niche market at the moment and then find cooperation with other day hospitals in order to create a footprint or network in South Africa. The medical schemes in South Africa, part of their regulations and the regulatory environment requires that if you provide a plan or option, that that must be equal to everybody in that plan. So when we want to say day hospitals must be prominent and significant in a certain plan or option of theirs, we need to have a proper footprint and that's what we're working towards with the other day hospitals. Then lastly, where are we going with our marketing initiatives and where, where are we going to find more utilization? We need to increase the occupancy, strong revenue growth, which we currently achieve and we would like to continue on that. Discipline utilization trends, which speaks to the case mix, not all procedures has the same cost of sales or percentage to that so you obviously want a certain mix to ensure that you have a reasonable gross profit for, uh, with overall for a facility and then working with the various medical schemes as already mentioned then what's our core focus on marketing initiative we want to refine our strategy one is theater optimization that requires us to engage with doctors and specialists more and more and convince them that it's an easier, friendlier environment. You never bumped out of theatre because there's no emergencies. You always have the same scrub system. It's a lot easier when it comes to administration. There's a number of things that plays a part. Improve surgery diversity, nursing excellence and patient satisfaction which we quite have good quality and standards of already. Wider referral basis, which is something that we work <coughs> on, especially from the GP to the specialist, and then that the specialists come in and come uh, do their procedures in our hospitals, and then possible private-public um, partnership opportunities that we're looking at at the moment, as well as community outreach, which is our CSI in, um, programs. Thank you. I'm now going to introduce my colleague Mark to talk about the Australia performance. Thank you. Can I use this one? Yeah. Okay. Right, good afternoon everybody. 
I'll just take you through half a dozen slides at the end of it. Please feel comfortable to ask me any questions and explanations to you. And I thought it's best we'll just run through these. <coughs> Point this way. That way. Give no, that. give me the other one. Cresmed is situated in, at this particular stage, only in one of the states in Australia, which is called New South Wales, and it's a particular aspect of our strategy that we wanted to do that in the initial stages, and focus predominantly in that particular area where there is the most health fund cover or the medical scheme cover in that particular area. Our main disciplines, there are four of them, ophthalmic surgery in itself, ear, nose and throat, oral maxillofacial and plastic surgery. Specifically only in those areas we all find that that is complementary and we can look at cost efficiencies by focusing on those. Uh, we like to believe that we are experienced and uh, respected in the day hospital but I'll talk a bit about the second line which is really achieving positive engagement with doctors, our stakeholders and the private health insurance market in itself. Our business is totally reliant on surgeons, surgeons to bring numbers through, bringing the numbers through falls down to the bottom line, so it's very, very key to our business, as in any business. We have over 130 specialists in our five-day facilities. All of the facilities do have state-of-the-art of, the, of the equipment, which is obviously a, a huge capex item, but the competitive market is so, so intense there, we have to keep up with that type of business. Our model is a different model to some of the other models there where we do not employ doctors. Some of our competition do, they buy them out and employ them, but we rather partner with our doctors. We believe they must be the captain of their own ships and we need to work with them and we offer shareholding in our facilities and by offering shareholding there is an inherent stake and in the support of the business going forward. Just a very brief timeline for us. Uh, we first started very small in 1997 where we set up our first ophthalmic facility. Uh, in 2000, we partnered with seven doctors, and this is the key that I spoke about. It's all about partnering. It's getting an initial base of doctors to work together and trying to drive the business forward. In 2004, we went into another area, partnered with five doctors there and set up in a, in a suburb called Epi. In 2010, we went to the northern part of Sydney, about an hour and a half drive north of it, to a place called Central Coast, partnered with five doctors there, and set up the only laser vision facility in the whole of that particular area. We chose that area because cataract surgery is predominantly 60 years plus, most of the population, and that's a retirement area, and that was specific why we went there. Uh, 2015, we then partnered with another four ENT surgeons. We acquired their business, which was a specific ENT day surgery facility. And in 2016, we moved into the Chatswood Private Hospital, taking the two facilities into one particular hospital, which has got six theatres. So it's a very big day hospital. In 2017, we partnered again with four doctors in another area called Hornsby. And in that particular area, we were very proud that we were awarded uh, associate membership of the World Association of Eye Hospitals and the only hospital day or overnight in Australia to have received that. Uh, 2018, we also got uh, approval as a teaching hospital through the University of Sydney, uh, as well as being approved as an ophthalmic registering training unit. Uh, 2019, again, we partnered with the doctor owned group uh, in another area. And this is specifically what I mentioned, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, where you can see where you partner with some doctors and how the growth of that leads forward. Just as a brief overview, in the, just to give you an idea of the number of theatres that we have in our facilities when it was established. And we started with four surgeons, we've got 16 surgeons there now. Central Coast, two theatres, the laser, uh, also start, started with a five, four or five surgeons, another one joined. We've now got 17 surgeons there. Chatswood Private Hospital, in 2016, we've got 90 surgeons working at that hospital. Uh, Madison Day Surgery, one small theater with, with four surgeons that remain there. 
and finally MetWest, which was the latest one that we've gone into, that was in 2019, and there it started with one doctors, and already there are nine doctors working. So that is key and critical for the business to go forward. Just briefly, I wanted to talk about the consolidated group accounts, and this is from the financial management. This does not include IFRS because we want to do a comparison like for like. Uh, last year, 8,300 patients, we've gone marginally up, as you've seen, by 2%. Our revenue, $16.1 million, gone to $16.8 million, the 2%. The EBITDA, $2 million, and this year, gone up to 2.6. And the uh, net profit before tax, $1.2 million, going to 1.8. Last year, one of the investor analysts asked me a question to say, what percentage would we like to try and achieve? You might recall we had a hospital that lost a lot of money and we made a, a decision to actually close that hospital down because it was costing the company money and I asked the question and I said at that particular time I wanted the net profit to be um, to try and achieve 10% of the revenue and the EBITDA 15% and I'm pleased within these six months after we got rid of that hospital we've now achieved that. I think it's important just to give you a flavor of our strategic uh, focus what we do so there's a strategy and implementation I started off, and I'll end off with this, this business is about doctors, it's about getting patients and driving patient numbers, and how do we do that? We spend an inordinate amount of time talking to new surgeons to join existing practices and therefore trying to drive up the patients through. For a new surgeon to go and set up in an area on their own becomes very difficult for them to get patients, but larger practices can push more patients through. And obviously to encourage our existing surgeons who do work in multiple facilities, to try and consolidate and bring that work back to us. Health fund or, or medical scheme negotiations as a group, we can negotiate better and we can tend to try and achieve higher rebates. Uh, we have a different structure to South Africa, the way that we are rebated, I can talk about that a bit later. And also the four types of specialty surgeries that we look at are called higher rebate surgeries and that's important for us when we have fixed costs in the business. Ensuring the cost control objectives are met, this is very key and crucial to us. Management spend a lot of our time with our surgeons to work together to standardize the, the use of certain surgical appliances, whether it is going to be lenses or, or viscoelastic, etc. And therefore, by, by actually trying to standardize it, we can get better margins because we cannot charge um, for each and every item as you can in, in most of the instances here. Staff development programs, we put our nursing staff through there because nursing staff are clinically trained, but this is a business as well. We need to get them to understand the financial aspects, which has proved successful too. Efficiency in cash collection, same time as getting that through. A strong focus, we ensure that 95% is within the 30 days and we achieve that. And I'm, I'm very delighted to say that in the last financial year, we did not have one bad debt in our business. And finally, the fifth one is pursuing investment opportunities. Following our recent strategic investment in MetWest, that's the last one I showed in 2019, we've identified several other opportunities in the Australian market and we remain in communication with these day hospitals and hopefully at the next time that I'm here I'm able to say that we have achieved something further. Finally, just in a summary overview, again our business, we need to be consistent with organic growth with our existing facilities low <coughs> surgical volume and strong management processes to contain costs, everything to fall hopefully to the bottom line. And concurrently, and I just reiterate, we actively look to grow our business in the portfolio in the uh, hospital markets. So the focus now is that we do not look to set up new facilities, but rather to buy into those that are profitable so we can maximise our shareholder value. And uh, thank you very much for your time. And if there are any questions, glad you take them. Um, that's any questions, not only for Australia. So we are available afterwards if you want to engage us. But if you want to ask a question now, please do. Um, Is there a microphone? Hello. Okay, no, it's not necessary. My name is Johannes. <coughs> I represent a small shareholder, I believe. So we, uh, we are a private company and we have a couple million advanced shares. Mm -hmm. 
Um, the first question is fairly easy. Is, is the overall group cash positive today? Um, we have some funding, so if you ask me on its own, no. Because I remember on a previous presentation, I think it was, uh, I picked it up somewhere that it was stated that you are sort of cash positive, meaning the next, over the next six months, will we see, apart from that 58 million that would be flowing in, will we see that liability coming down? Because we, yes. we would, uh, I think we're anxious to see yeah that you don't need more cash. And I yeah. believe coal is the one that is... Absolutely, that was that. up till now, but yes, sorry, I misunderstood your question. We will be um, cash positive. Okay, uh, may I ask a second question, if there's no yeah. one in the queue? Um, uh, something that, that I've spent a lot of time on trying to figure out, since all the numbers are not that available, and I've looked at, mm -hmm. at all the the previous uh, webcast that exists that I could find was basically the utilization and at which point one would see uh, net profit going into the black, getting out of the red. And um, so obviously I don't see that type of information as confidential, but between the two subsidiaries or the holding company feels that the South African numbers are confidential while the president of Australia has been more free in providing those numbers. But I was able to pick up most of those numbers from uh, percentages that were given and so on. So according to my own numbers, we must be sitting at around 61% utilization in South Africa, meaning number of procedures versus the maximum number that you could do. In Australia, it must be more than 100% now. Uh, in, in the pre-listing statement, I think the figure was something like 40%, uh, 34% if you work out the number of cases per theatre, etc. Et et so obviously we fall beyond that. Yes. So as, as investors, we would like to have a, perhaps a better line of sight so that we can see, okay, this is the trend, we're growing at this percentage, 65% or 70% or whatever is the point at which we will see net profit. And mm. after that, uh, well, I think a lot of problems will dissolve in terms of share price and, yeah. and, and anxiety and so on. So, so let, I don't think you will give an answer now, but I, I'll I ask will, you nevertheless. I, I will give a limited answer. <laughs> Firstly, I can assure you it's available even on facility level. So we know which hospital, how many more cases they must do. I'm not sure why it's not public available, but we can give it to you and it should be included in going forward. Um, but you're definitely right about your numbers in the sense there needs to be significant improvement in the number of cases before it totally changes. It's not that out of reach. I think the point we're making is that we're at a point where we underestimated, as I said, the competition cost, how long and how difficult it would be to bring people, as well as the, the sluggish economy. But we should be there very soon. And, and if you don't mind, we can still give you the numbers before you leave. Yeah. And that applies to anybody. I just don't have it at hand, but it's available here. Okay, thank you. That's all. Okay. I think it's a fair question, if I can just finish off, to say, you know, when is that point? And, and can we give some comfort at how you look at it and stuff? We, we thought we would be after year three, between year three and four profitable, or at least cash positive. And it is taking now in excess of five years. But what we've learned very clearly, it works very much like the hotel industry. It takes longer than what we thought because of the high fixed cost that we said. It's not an excuse, it just means we got it wrong initially. We were overly optimistic. We need to look at all the factors. But I would please like to share that with you, the numbers, and, and we will make sure that it's available in the future as well. Thank you.